First of all, thank you very much for being here and for attending this press conference that I, I consider it was crucial to, to permit uh, to you as uh, the persons in charge to deliver truth and to have the responsibility to know the truth and to, and to make it public. Um, to have all the information that is needed to explain clearly what is really happening right now in Venezuela. I'm going to make uh, my intervention in five points. The first one regarding um, the issues regarding legitimacy of the current official only government of the President Nicolás Maduro Moros. Secondly, to speak clearly about what he was called and has been framed as humanitarian crisis, as for those that are trying to uh, attend a coup and a regime chain using the same methods that were used in different cases before in the world, so called the methods used by the United States of America. Then to explain what are the elements of Mr. Guaido coup attempt that recently failed to, to achieve his goals, that recently was even recognized by the Minister of Foreign Affairs Borrell from Spain. And finally, I'm going to make the point about where we are right now and where we are heading to regarding the dialogue um, scenarios, the two dialogue scenarios that are in the table right now, one of them with the participation of the European Union as a whole. So uh, I made some um, um, pictures to try to also accompany my intervention with some illustrations regarding fake news that were recently put forward by some medias, uh, including European media. So first of all, I have to start with the point of the part of the non-recognition of uh, President Nicolás Maduro as framed by the European Union. As you see the Constitution of Venezuela, which is the only framework in which we can talk about legitimacy of the government, clearly stated the power for the President to call for a national constituent assembly. But I'm going to show you that this was actually a call that the um, opposition made in 2004. There was a video about um, the famous, uh, a famous face of the opposition, which is Lilian Tintori, which is the wife of uh, one political um, actor from the party Voluntad Popular, which is the same party that Mr. Guado made part of. And uh, they were calling for the National Constituent Assembly since 2014. Well, what is the point of the part of the whole problem that we have right now? The European Union is starting saying that they don't recognize uh, Mr. President Maduro's um, position right now, um, a cause of this, um, because in the part they don't recognize the National Constituent Assembly as having the power for uh, calling at election, elections. The decision of providing elections in advance uh, logically shouldn't be uh, uh, a call for a president that should stay in power calmly until December. It came as a result of a debate and a dialogue that was held both by the government and the opposition in the Dominican Republic. And at that moment, one of the points and the call for the opposition was to advance the elections, the presidential elections. Um, so, as that was one of the outcomes of the dialogue in the Dominican Republic, um, that later... Uh, uh, the
podría representar un fin a la crisis política y económica que atraviesa la nación. ¿Cómo se está realizando esta actividad el día de hoy? Bueno, hoy es un día histórico, el pueblo está en la calle firmando, firmando por la constituyente. Den un paso hacia adelante, den un paso hacia la construcción de la Venezuela que ustedes merecen y dar el paso a firmar. Ya yo firmé por la constituyente. Tengo, yo tenía 40 días sin ver a Leopoldo y ayer tuve la oportunidad de entrar a la cárcel de Ramo Verde y conversar con él y me explicó una vez más qué es la constituyente y por qué es tan importante firmar. Y yo estoy convencida y enamorada de poder constituyente. Bien, estas eran declaraciones de Lilian Titor y esposa de Leopoldo López, quien estaba pues en esta... As you see, uh, in 2014, Voluntad Popular, which is the body of Mr. Guaidó, were calling for a constituency uh, assembly to be uh, uh, put forward. And actually, they collected signatures, as the video shows, and they made a national collection of signatures and, uh, to try to address to the government the demands of calling for a national constituent assembly. So the government did so. And right now, after the constituent assembly was put forward, the opponents said that they don't recognize the outcomes of the constituent assembly. As I'm going to put you forward, the constituent assembly in the article 347 and 348 gives the initiative to the constituent assembly to the president, and so he did, and he called for this constituent assembly to be put forward. So that is the origin of the elections that were held in May 20 last year. Not other, but actually, again, a call from the opposition leaders to have in advance elections and to try to have a regime change before December 2018. Um, just to make you the point, this is and these are the results of uh, Mr. President Nicolás Maduro um, elections in May last year. I have to make a very important point. The EU was formally invited as an observer to these elections, and the EU refused to attend as observer to these elections, saying that they did not recognize the National Constituent Assembly. So in this point, I have to say, even before the elections were held, the European Union said that they will not recognize these elections because they consider they were not going to be transparent, inclusive, before the elections happened. This I have to underline. And that they were formally invited. Our Minister of Foreign Affairs came to Brussels and gave the letter of invitation in his hand to Federica Mogherini, and I am a witness of that meeting. So what is happening in Venezuela now is the continuation or the attempt of coup that has started with the help of the United States and with the provisions from the United States since 2015. As you can see, and you might remember the violence that were put forward in 2015, then 2017, and at that time in 2017, the, the cause of those violent riots in the streets were advanced elections. That was the naming of, the, of, of that. In 2015, they were calling for the National Constituent Assembly, as I show you in the video. And in 2017, they were calling for elections. And so they happened. So the point is this. Other political parties participate in the elections of May 20, last year. The fact that a few most violent political parties did not participate doesn't give floor to actually not recognize the results of an election. Not participation is not a point for not considering those not inclusive. So the second point is would be, is there a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela? So the answer is simple, is no. There is no humanitarian crisis. What is happening in Venezuela right now is the result of a blockage, financial, commercial, and later including the private banks that actually capture more recently all the assets 
from Venezuela and all the international accounts, Venezuelan international accounts in the U.S. ground were hold and captured by the United States with no legal basis to do so. So what is happening right now is that we are a country that it is economically sequestrated by the United States. So is that the case for the re and, and only the, the only reason, as Matt some points, is that the only reason for um, the, the kind of um, situations that we see, the lack of certain medications? Yes, people, yes. Actually, the United States is blocking the possibility to the country to actually buy formally anything from the international market. Going beyond that, the United States made and enlarged the sanctions last week to actually impel the country to be able to trade through third countries. So the countries or whichever get in touch economically or financially with our country or whichever representative of the country will be then again sanctioned. The consequences for that is that we have, for example, in the European Union, um, certain assets that were also hold. As for in England, our gold for an amount of more than one billion dollars that was requested one month ago for the country to be transferred back home. The International um, Bank in, um, in England said no, and the money is over there captured. Secondly, Euroclear, that is based here in Brussels, also has almost two billion dollars that belongs to the Venezuelan people hold both in current cash and actually in bonds. And those are here captured as well. In exchange of that, the US that right now and since last week has moved forward to also detain as for them the assets and the goods, Venezuelan goods, both in furniture, buildings that belongs to our international Citgo company, which is a refinery that we have in the United States, with more than um, 14,000 um, uh, gas uh, suppliers all over the country, but both in the north region and in the south, for an amount that gets to almost 30 billion dollars, assets that are as well since last week captured in the United States. And beyond that, in the more fragrant um, violation of international law, which is not the first time, the first time was actually something similar was made in 2003 to Iraq. So this capturing of the holes was put um, in the hands or at the disposition of Mr. White though, with no legal basis to do so. So the U.S. is financing with our resources, a coup, which is the most indiscreet way in which they have moved forward ever in their history. Before, in the times of um, in the times of the Plan Condor, that you might recall what it implies in Latin America, at least the U.S. was simulating and using intelligence to get in the ground. Right now, we have the faces of um, certain personages and characters from the high level um, American government calling for this regime change openly and fragrantly, uh, explicitly, at a point that is almost vulgar in political terms. What is the legitimacy of Mr. Guaido? For those that are part of certain countries that have recognized a government even when EU has no legal standards for recognition of governments, relationships internationally are whole between the states, no government. Actually, we got um, to the point to have um, a document that was produced by the German scientific body that actually um, uh, produce information, legal information, as the basis for the government to take decisions, explicitly saying 
that a recognition of such a government would be a flagrant violation of international law and there will be no basis for certain countries to do so. Even though, as this is a political coup, this is the basis that actually Mr. Guaido claims in which he has proclaimed himself, also proclaimed himself, president of the country. The article 233 of the Constitution is the one that calls for um, absences, uh, definitive as absence of uh, president, including death or uh, a sickness or not a temporary absence, but actually a, a full, a complete absence, which is what Guaido claims happened. Even we, when we know it doesn't. Actually, uh, if we take as the basis Mr. Guaido points regarding his position as interim, which is a figure that, as you see, doesn't exist in our constitution, the word interim doesn't figure at all in the constitution. So that is why all the countries use charge in charge. So that doesn't exist anymore. So it doesn't exist. It only provides that person to take into power for and to produce election, not to call for, but actually to do them in 30 days. That is why the 23rd of February came out to the international arena as a, as a date and a new deadline, because that was actually the deadline of the so-called autoproclamation of Mr. Guaido, which since is nothing more than the president of the National Assembly, which is his role and the one that he was elected for. So I made the point about the decisions made by the US. We can move forward. And what recently happened in the, in the border that you um, heard and knew a lot about. Actually, the Red Cross and the Media Luna, the Demi Moon Rouge in uh, Colombia, but also the representatives from the Vatican said that, that what, what it was there in the border was not in the framings and in the, in the characteristics and under the indicators of the UN could be considered as humanitarian help. As the first point that was, just to make it clear, a show also with a concert to actually break the borders and produce a coup by force. American, United States American forces were in the ground in Colombia using the territory of a neighbor country to get by force in the country. I just call you to try to figure out or to imagine and to make an exercise of imagination if whichever country gets in order of no, doesn't matter which uh, European state with a big truck trying to push and to force humanitarian help to another country. What would happen? I'm just getting you to imagine if Venezuela decides to put a truck with humanitarian help to get into the borders of Melilla and Ceuta, do you think that Spain would allow that to happen? Do you think so? Well, I have the videos of what really happened. There was a lot of noise regarding the fact that the guards, national guards of Venezuela burned the humanitarian help, that the government of Maduro was so cruel that he destroyed the humanitarian help that was there and medications. There were no medications in these trucks. Actually, both the USAID said there were supplies, medical supplies, but there were also towels, um, drafts for the beds, I mean, linen for beds and such on. There were no medication in those trucks. But actually, they were not burned by us. Then we got to images that can make you see how peaceful there was the intervention of this humanitarian hell. This is what happened on the 23rd with the... Just try to imagine 
Guard of Venezuela that never left our territory. also denounce the fake use of their symbols in this manifestation. And that was made possible.
is what it was remaining for the trucks that are still in the Colombian territory. And there was an inspection that was made later on by both forces. So as you see, there were wires, clues, and all kind of uh, remainings of what it seems to be uh, provisions for continuing the kind of riots that happened in 2017 when they put actually riots were used to cut the streets <clears throat> and actually we had the cases of um, three murder people that were decapitated with the use of these wires to cut the streets. So uh, there were clues and all kind of artisanal weapons and the, the, that was the remains of um, of what it was supposed to be humanitarian help. I just called you to remember not to, if you don't want to trust me or the videos, actually to remember that that happened with Nicaragua and there is a case that was put forward between Nicaragua and the United States in the International Court of Justice and Nicaragua gain in the point of US's getting arms and provisions for the opposition through what it was at that time for humanitarian uh, containers. So what is happening in Venezuela is an attempt of coup for a regime change in which Mr. Guaido is an agent and is acting as an agent of the American government. The situation now is that the coup failed. That is what is happening now. The coup failed. He had 30 days. And, and it was admitted for some reason, no one expected our people to remain in peace, our country to remain in peace, and actually um, the, arm, the armed force, the force in the country to remain attached to the constitution and not willing to push. <coughs> These are some examples of, the, and you have seen, how much openly Pence, Elliot Abrahams, who was a person that was involved also in re previous histories regarding interventions and regime change in Latin America, they were and have been explicit, explicit about and almost proud about uh, doing this regime change in, the, in Venezuela. But I have to make the point. This is an international coup. In the national ground, the people is at ease and in peace. And this is something that was a surprise even for those European countries that supported this coup and continue to do so. There are two open processes right now for dialogue. One that has been put forward for um, Mexico, Uruguay, and 15 Caribbean countries that get together under the name of CARICOM, which is an organization, an international organization of 15 Caribbean countries, which Barbados right now is the, the head. And they propose an open dialogue with four faces, not issues, but faces. Immediate dialogue, negotiation, commitments, and implementation. And they are, at the difference with the next one that I'm going to show you later about the EU proposal, the difference is that these Latin American countries are ready to step in as mediators in the political crisis that it is right now. This is the process proposed by uh, the European Union with Uruguay. It is known as the International Contact Group on Venezuela, these are the countries that may be part of this international contact group. As you can see, there is an open and evident unbalance, not only in the representation of both Latin and European members, but actually in their positions regarding <coughs> the, the situation and the coup promoted by US and Guaido. As you see in the column, in the right, 
is, well, or in the left for you, is uh, there is France that openly supported Guaido, Germany that also did so, Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, United Kingdom, Ecuador and Costa Rica. All these countries had supported openly Mr. Guaido. Beyond that, they call him, some of them, but there are nuances in the so-called recognition. There are nuances, I have to say. Some, as Ecuador, Costa Rica, call Mr. Guaido the president of the republic. Some others doesn't get that far. And there are some others which are more interested. That actually, at the beginning of the coup, they started calling him president in charge. Later on, they started to call him president. Later on, they started to call him, I don't know what. So they don't know where they stand. Costa Rica actually accepted a so-called ambassador appointed by Mr. Guaido and appointed to Mr. Guaido to this country. And actually this so-called ambassador took by force the embassy and the mission in the country and took um, the siege in, in the embassy by force and um, Actually, uh, we had uh, the same days, we had uh, a threat in Belgium that uh, such a movement was going to be done here as well. Thankfully, we count on the basis of the Belgian respect of international law and the not acceptance of such call and the support of Belgium to try to avoid, with the help of the police, a takeover of the embassy in Brussels. So, didn't happen. Venezuela is not alone. What happened is that right now, Mr. Guaido and his Voluntad Popular party has kidnapped the possibility of a dialogue in the country. But actually, it's just not um, staying there. For those that actually, and that is a point that I have to make, regarding, for example, European Union's positions, which are so divided regarding the Venezuela issue right now, there is an extreme incoherence in saying that you promote dialogue in the country and a peaceful resolution of the issues of the Venezuelan by the Venezuelans, and then at the same time said that you support, or some of these countries in the European Union support, an illegitimate, illegitimate, also proclaim so-called president, a parallel president, with a clear U.S. agenda for a coup. And that is openly calling, openly calling for a military intervention from the U.S. in the country. Right now, it is about those, not that support Maduro and that likes the government, but actually the international community should be aware that Venezuela is at risk, at serious risk, of being intervened by the U.S. rather through them and their direct actions or rather through the help of the Colombian territory. So that is a very critical point. Venezuela is a very important country that has boundaries with the European Union. We are a border country with the European Union. We also do have almost two million double citizenships, European Venezuelan citizenships in the country, that of course, if a situation is given that it is a military intervention, of course these people are going to fly back home, which is right here. In a period in which the European Union should be calling for peace, we have this division, which is quite worrying, of some countries still promoting and giving air to this dying coup d'etat. What happened with the Guaido, and you are going to see, is just a story that in the days from now should disappear as all the histories of coup, failed coups, should. And we have to move on and pass this page and start promoting and calling and supporting every single actor that calls responsibly for dialogue in the country and for a peaceful solution on Venezuela's situations and actually to put an end to whatever Trump's agenda is 
in the country regarding, of course, our oil, as he mentioned himself. It's not me saying it. He made a statement in Miami in which he was absolutely clear about his purposes and how much it would be extremely profitable for him to intervene and for his country to intervene, a country that is, I mean, an, an oil that is just three hours away of his, instead of buying from the other side of the world, why not to take the reserves that are there? It's not me speaking, it's him speaking. So um, I call you on you as the providers of truth to make a team to all those that wants to promote a peaceful solution and dialogue and actually not saying and calling for you to do more than actually saying and speaking the truth. The country continue providing his social programs. Of course, we are in an extremely difficult economical situation that we were forced to be. But we continue promoting social protection, education, social housing, and of course, trying to reach every single alternative in our economies to try to survive to these um, intentions of the U.S. to strangle our economy to the point of destroying the government. This is beyond government. This is our people, and our people are suffering. These are not individual sanctions. These are sanctions that are hurting everybody in the country and should not be supported by anyone less by the European Union or their countries. For those that are interested in following more um, about the timelines of the declarations on the U.S. regarding the Venezuela situation, we have made a document that actually points, for example, in the 22, that they rather tweet or pronounce at 11, 12, 5, 1227, 114, 117, 129, and so on. So I have this document for those that are interested in following how much how much information the US produced regarding Venezuela. By minutes. By minutes. And these are not tweets by opinions or, or, or circles. These are tweets that belong to the heads of this government. So it's not then again not me speaking. These are the proofs of what is happening and how much Guaido is attached to this particular agenda. So for what it is humanitarian cases, the EU is right now uh, in conversations with the country. Um, the delega uh, de a technical delegation from the International Contact Group went to Venezuela two weeks ago. They were there, they meet with everybody, both the opposition and the government and also civil society and also the church and some other uh, NGOs that actually provide help in the ground. And uh, they said that the meetings were quite constructive and they are trying to build upon an agenda for the next ministerial meeting of the International Contact Group that is going to happen next week. So I continue working closely with the European Union and the external service of, um, to see how we can take upon this good faith to try to move forward in a different agenda than the Trump's agenda. But of course, this is a proposal, and there are actually in the EU countries that take different positions. As you might see yesterday, uh, certain ambassadors that are exercising in Caracas, going to the airport, calling that Guaido was getting back and he was going to be in prison, and they were making an explicit but a fantastic show in the airport. I don't see, in any case, as a professional diplomat, that this is quite professional and under the Vienna Convention. The first thing that you learn when you are in international school is that you cannot get involved in national issues. And that is always said in the first year of international school in diplomacy. So I was looking at my colleagues with a lot of uh, uh, surprise because I cannot imagine uh, any of us getting involved in national issues anywhere in Europe regarding your elections 
your participations, uh, your presidents, or saying that I don't like them. Uh, I should never do something like that. But this is the kind of ground in which we are moving now, in which the law is getting quite flu. And uh, I'm going always, I'm always going to be one of the ones being extremely strict with what it is right and what it is wrong. And not be afraid to say what, when, when something is extremely wrong. For what it is humanitarian needs, these are the ones that were pointed out by the UN last year, for this year. And there is Afghanistan, Burundi, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Haiti, Iraq, Libya, Mali, Myanmar, Niger. So you see many of the names that are mentioning uh, countries that have got the help and the promotion of democracy by the US. And now they are in humanitarian crisis. Now they are. Libya was not uh, an economical crisis when the US decided to go there. So don't believe that a critical economical situation could be at any point the basis for a regime change by force. It's not. It happened in previous countries that were doing extremely well. So this is just an excuse to try to move forward. As the humanitarian crisis, as the force enforcement for humanitarian help, as you can pull together the word enforcement and help. You can. So I think at, that's, at this point I would stop to get from you questions because I think you might have a lot and I'm open to talk about whatever you want to with no um, uh, time frames but the ones that you want. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Thomas Miglierina, Swiss Television. How do you see the role of Federica Mogherini? How, how did he play in this crisis? And do you have hopes in the position of the Italian government as one of the few big ones in the EU that said something different? I don't know if taking yeah. Yeah. a few and then respond. And if uh, someone can, uh, uh, each one can present. Uh, <coughs> Marie-France Croix, du journal La Libre Belgique. I have two questions for you. Uh, one is about the, the embassy of Venezuela in Costa Rica. Uh, if I understood you well, you said that it was taken force. I did not understand by whom, if it was the Costa Rican or other Venezuelans and how it happened. And my second question is about the images you show. You said that the burned trucks were in Colombian territory. But then you show us the National Guard, I suppose it's the Venezuelan one, who goes and look for what is in the, in the trucks. So how come, how were the trucks, where were the trucks if the National Guard can go and look for things in it? Yes. Next question. <coughs> Please, uh, I have Onda Cero Radio, uh, Spanish I'd like to know which is, how would you describe the Spanish to all that? And if you can answer in Spanish, thank you. Tommaso Della Botti, in the Chrono Seat, I'm going to the first one, the first the first one, 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 the have you had any encounter or meeting with the uh, five star MPs here in Brussels? <coughs> I'm, I'm going to try to take it by three because otherwise it's going to be like. I'm, I'm going to take these three quickly. Um, because uh, there are two that are related to regarding um, Italy. Um, as my grandfather was from there, so I'm extremely happy that Italy had um, played a different role. And I don't think it's a government, it's a state position. I think they have been uh, formal in the sense of not falling in this uh, history of recognizing governments, or not governments, but actually to remain attached to their own laws. And I think that is something that they have been quite um, formal in saying so. They don't go to the point to say that they like or not whether one government or the other, they like Maduro, they don't like Maduro, they don't go there, they just stay formal to their own legislation, saying that uh, it's not in their 
And actually, in, in none of the European countries, there is no legal basis for recognition of governments, as the German document proved it later on when we got to this document. If I have hope uh, on the Mogherini role, I have to say, as a, as a woman and as, also as a, a little bit Italian somewhere, uh, that this was one of the persons that actually worked strongly uh, from the inside of the European institutions to try to make the point on Latin America as a, as a, as a whole. And she worked very hard during his um, tenure to, to make Latin America regain a role in the in the relationship with the EU as a whole, um, both in the CELAC EU meetings and um, in all the framings that we have and we still have going on between the two, I think the, this was one of the persons that actually moved forward this agenda. And I think the, the case with Cuba shows very well how much can help someone when, when, when they try just to uh, stop this stupid, and I have to say, demonization of countries. Uh, and actually see the country about what they are and they respect them with the whole and move forward to have good relationship with them. And we saw the results of that good movement from her in the relationship specifically with Cuba. I think uh, she got this idea with the, of the international contact group and um, we as government and as a country, we celebrate everything that goes in the direction of peaceful solutions and dialogue solutions. We cannot see, for example, elections being imposed or forced. We know for recent cases in Europe that you cannot force elections nowhere. That doesn't result. It needs a dialogue, it needs a cohesion between the societies. If I get hope, of course, as a Venezuelan, of course, I will always be hopeful. Because I choose a career in which you actually have to try very hard. And we have seen in diplomacy that when the things are do well, you get good results before war explodes. And yes, of course, I have to have hope for all the people in my country that are there and that hope that we do good our jobs. Um, if I have a contact with Cinque Stelle here, yes, yes with every, I mean, I think the, the lobby in the parliament takes, I think, 80% of our time uh, as diplomats for all the ones that deal with the EU. And we talk with absolutely everybody we have now uh, an open invitation for a delegation that is going to be presided not by Cinco Stelle, but by, uh, by another um, euro deputy that are going to be uh, coming to venezuela next week in a formal uh, and open invitation to the um, to the human rights commission and uh, they are putting forward this um, group to go to go there formally invited not forcing their entry as some others try to, to make but actually doing the things correctly Regarding Costa Rica situation, uh, that was actually um, a uh, violent um, took over that was promoted by the person that was appointed as ambassador for Mr. Guaido, and she got there with uh, with other. It was a quite uh, frightening weekend that we actually slept in the embassy to try to prevent that something happened or damage was happened to to our CH or the interests of our nationals that are there in the consulate. Who burns the uh, trucks for is there? Yes, of course, that is, but, but, okay. So I'm going to get up to show you. This is the border. This is the border right now. So this is the formal migration scale that you go to. But as you see in um, in Europe, when the, when the borders are in bridges, Normally, the border goes for the medium of the, the mid, la, ligne, la ligne moyenne de, de fleuve. Mm. Donc, la frontière, bien sûr, ça ne pas rentrer le territoire vénézuélien en tant que tel, mais la ligne divisoire, c'est la moyenne de fleuve. Mais les ponts ont un caractère international. Donc, c'est pour ça que les gardes n'ont pas passé, ne passent pas during the manifestation of the opposition to try to avoid, because that was the order, to avoid any violence in the region, anything. So once that they were removed by the authorities of the Colombian border, that video was made both by the Colombians and the Venezuelan guards that actually got together to, to try to see what was happening. Because what is happening right now, and that happened also in the border uh, with Brazil, 
that actually the guards, the ones that actually hold the weapons, they know that the situation is being forced from outside. They don't want that confrontation. And they did this sort of agreement in the ground that they will try to help each other to try to avoid because these people are right now that the bridges are controlled. They are running uh, down the bridge and using the bridge to pass from one side to the other. It's a very permeable, um, as you can see, it's a very, uh, how do you say permeable? Permeable. Permeable. Um, <laughs> order. <laughs> What else are ah, the Spanish reaction? I love that question. Can you get the video? I think it would be precious to see it. Because that was a gift that was given for Morel yesterday. He made us a gift to be clear. No, debe estar en la pantalla, en la pantalla, sobre el. This is a precious moment, one of the best of the week. It will be more clear than I can. a lo que representa este vídeo para usted o lo que representa la posición española, por favor. Yo creo que habiendo tenido una oportunidad preciosa de clamando siempre, permanentemente, que Venezuela es tan cercana al corazón y que los intereses de Venezuela le preocupan tanto al gobierno español, no fue por falta de invitación que se le hiciera formalmente a participar del diálogo y de la promoción del diálogo, no solamente desde el gobierno venezolano, sino por parte de otros actores, y que hayan tomado la decisión de secundar a Trump. Eh, es cierto que el argumento que dan es la campaña electoral. 
pues yo considero como diplomática, pero sobre todo como venezolana y como madre, que cualquiera que quiera hacer y promover su campaña electoral con la sangre de mi pueblo, que los electores se lo cobren en las urnas y ya pronto se verá. Que sea la decisión del propio pueblo español el rol, que lo juzguen el propio pueblo español lo que ha ocurrido con, con este acomodo de, del gobierno de Sánchez a, a la política de invasión de los Estados Unidos. A considerar que un presidente que pone fronteras y que quiere hacer muro para separar América Latina de nosotros, que destruye el acuerdo climático, sea el presidente más filantrópico del mundo y más preocupado por los derechos humanos de nadie. Eso es triste, por no decir verdad. Pero Borrell creo que fue sumamente explícito. Habría que preguntarle a él cuando él habla de los que promovieron este golpe y de alguna manera, porque es capaz de responderlo si no se refiere también a España, que no lo dice. Pero creo que está clarísimo en su intervención que abiertamente diga que nadie, no sé quiénes, esperaban que el pueblo venezolano resistiera, que el presidente Maduro fuese apoyado por el pueblo que lo eligió y esa es la situación el pueblo, el pueblo venezolano escogió a ese presidente le guste a España o no le guste a algunos países de la Unión Europea o no, de eso va la democracia Entonces, esto va a respetar, él dice que esto no está escrito en ningún librito de derecho internacional, bueno yo le puedo mostrar un librito en el que sí no está escrito nada sobre su presidente interino, este libro en español aquí no dice nada del presidente interino que él dice aprobado en este librito no dice nada de que Guaidó es presidente porque aquí no lo dice. Si él no quiere respetar el derecho internacional. Y hay bastantes libritos de derecho internacional que Borrell también se puede leer con relación a la ayuda humanitaria, cómo se caracteriza, cuáles son los indicadores y todo eso es información objetiva que él puede buscar si piensa que no hay libritos de derecho internacional que digan lo que está pasando. Pero también, no es que es tan innovador como él lo dice, no es que es tan innovador este tipo de intervenciones se han dado antes, no solamente en América Latina, sino se dieron en Libia, se dieron en Irak. En Irak también participó España y en ese momento uno agarró experiencia. Es triste, es triste, de verdad. Ahora agarro tres más. Eh, hay un señor allá, ella aquí y... Vladimir Kaler, de Drapo Rouge. I'd like to underline two statements which, in my opinion, are very important. One, words from president of Total, the French oil company. I think it has a lot of meaning. He said that he wishes that Venezuela will recover democracy in interest of her humanity. Of course, he didn't say in interest of Total interest. Second statement, which is very important in my opinion, Mr. Bolton, he insisted the fact that Venezuela is very close to the United States in terms of geography. This means, and the journalist of Washington Post mentioned, are you coming back to the <coughs> Monroe's doctrine? And he answered, well, you understand very well my statement. This two statements seem to me very, very important to underline this kind of international coup. And I would like to ask you a small question. What about the position of Greece and the Mr. Tsipras government about this crisis? Thank you. Quelles sont les expectatives du gouvernement venezuelen pour la prochaine ministérielle du groupe du contact Je ne suis pas 100% sûre si, euh, si, si toujours Caracas trouve que ça peut être quelque chose qui peut aider à une solution finale. Euh, Est-ce que l'idée de faire euh, une bonne élection euh, parlementaire et présidentielle en même temps euh, à l'avance, est-ce que ça c'est une chose envisageable ou pas Et euh, s'il y a des possibilités pour l'Union Européenne d'avoir euh, un plus euh, fort euh, rôle euh, euh, concernant l'aide humanitaire On sait que la Russie a donné euh, quelques aides aussi à Venezuela dans le dernier temps. 
Euh, je ne sais pas si, si, si vous pensez qu'elle lui trouverait aussi un rôle euh, là. Et euh, une autre question, pardon. Si c'est possible de savoir exactement quel ambassadeur euh, de l'Union européenne euh, pourrait aller euh, à la rencontre de, de Guaido euh, hier euh, à l'aéroport. Hi, I'm Andres Hill from, from El Diario, Puerto Rico, Spain. I would like to ask you about the, you're talking about the, the peace process and dialogue. Uh, which are your red lines, if you have any? And, and where would you like to, to end this uh, peace process? What is your target in this peace process? Regarding the first, um, the, the first point, which is a, a, a particular one that is extremely linked with uh, the sanctions of the U.S., um, one of the chapters of the, of the sanctions is the General License 8. I gotta get my glasses to make sure. I do it wrongly. It's a more technical thing, but it's quite a, the economical key point of the sanctions, well, one of them, because there are 13 as a whole. General License 8 allows transactions related to activities by the U.S. service providers and joint ventures in, in the country. Uh, the partners that are currently working in Venezuela, and the, the list of license providers is limited right now to five firms. Chevron, Halliburton, Schlumberger, Barker Hughes, and Waterford International. The license is set to last six months and thus expired in the 27th of July 2019. The new ban that is put to these companies, which are not Venezuela, so it's just to convince you and to show you that it's not just about a list of Venezuelan government representatives. They are sanctioned all the economy around Venezuela. The ban allows any exports of diluent to Venezuela from the United States through this. These partners are fundamental to the functioning of our oil company. We have a heavy, heavy oil that needs these diluents to be able to be processed and then sell. <coughs> then the vanish of some providers open the door to new ones. I will not say more. This is business. This is business in the worst way possible. <coughs> I have also the points regarding the general license 10 and 14 and 13 that actually would make you show how the US has actually cut all and actual, actually these sanctions are touching upon the European interests as well and the European companies that are working right now in Venezuela. And these are just blocking to the point of not allowing any drop from oil to be able to be exported. But not on, only that, but actually everything that is linked with regarding fertilizers. We do have an, a company regarding fertilizers, plastic, I mean, everything that is linked to oil production. So whatever things is just oil is also food because oil produced fertilizers and fertilizers are key for agriculture. And if there is anyone that is extremely protectionist about agriculture, is the European Union. So they should understand quite quickly what is this about and the role of Total. Of course. Expectativas del gobierno venezolano de la primera ministerial, del grupo de contacto. Siempre las mejores. El grupo técnico del grupo de contacto estuvo en Venezuela, hicieron varias reuniones. Y en una reunión específica con el gobierno nacional, con la vicepresidenta Delcy Rodríguez, el canciller Jorge Arreaza, eh, se le entregó formalmente a la Unión Europea una lista de, de demandas, de solicitudes, de requerimientos dentro de las necesidades, como los medicamentos, y no solamente los medicamentos, sino también todos los insumos hospitalarios, han sido objeto de las sanciones americanas y están en las listas de las sanciones y las licencias, porque es un tema comercial, aparte de bancario. 
se le entregó la lista, que es con la que hemos venido trabajando también con Rusia, con la India y con otros países que han querido pues, apoyar. Esa lista de requerimientos llega al monto de 2 mil millones de dólares. Es por eso que surge esa cifra. No es que la Unión Europea se comprometió a darle 2 mil millones de dólares a Venezuela. No se dijo eso nunca. Se dijo que las necesidades abarcan 2 mil millones de dólares. Que Venezuela tiene ese dinero y está dispuesta a pagarlo. Solo que con la nueva lista de sanciones, Venezuela ha sido excluida desde hace una semana de todo el sistema SWIFT bancario. Entonces, por más que tengas el dinero, no puedes pagar las transacciones. Entonces, esa es la situación en la que estamos. Por eso es que uno de los componentes esenciales de la ayuda que necesitamos de la Unión Europea es tratar de buscar mecanismos de desbloqueo financiero. Es tan severo el bloqueo financiero y es tan sensible el nivel de presión de los Estados Unidos sobre la banca internacional que hasta las cuentas corrientes de los consulados venezolanos en territorio europeo están siendo cerradas, clausuradas. ¿Qué culpa tienen los ciudadanos venezolanos que viven en Bélgica o que viven en Roma que no puedan hacer un trámite consular porque las cuentas son bloqueadas? Esa es la situación en la que estamos. Nosotros tuvimos que cambiar el año pasado dos veces de banco, aquí en Bélgica. Sin, sin ser yo ni ninguno de mis empleados sancionados, de, ni de Europa ni de Estados Unidos. Y paga es la población de eso. ¿El rol humanitario de la Unión Europea puede ser mayor? Claro que sí. Nosotros tenemos, como repito, casi 2 mil millones de dólares bloqueados en Bruselas, en Euroclear. Claro que los pueden desbloquear. Claro que puede haber una decisión ejecutiva de los ministros para darle a los venezolanos su dinero, para que resuelvan sus necesidades. ¿Cuáles embajadores fueron al aeropuerto? Bueno, lo puedes buscar por Twitter. Yo vi varios allí, algunos los conozco, pero yo tengo tiempo fuera y no los conozco a todos, pero los veía muy animosos, esperando una, no sé. Lo único que sé es que a los pobres les arruinaron las vacaciones, porque en Venezuela hay vacaciones hoy, eh, toda esta semana, y están las playas llenas de gente. Entonces, a los pobres embajadores que sus capitales les dijeron que fueran al aeropuerto a rescatar a Guaidó, pues Guaidó entró por el aeropuerto, pasó migración, llegó a su casa y no pasó nada. Está en Caracas ahora mismo, tranquilo y feliz con su familia, y los pobres embajadores los mandaron al aeropuerto a, a salvarlo de, no sé, no sé qué información tendrían. Que, como ahí está, una dictadura que permite que el autoproclamado salga, entre, vuelva a entrar. En todo caso, pues ahí está, hay montones de videos que, que hacen el, la, la, la parodia. Yo los vi reciente esta mañana. ¿Cuáles son las líneas rojas del diálogo? ¿En español o en, en español? Sí, sí. sí. No hay líneas rojas del diálogo. El presidente Maduro lo ha dicho todo el tiempo, pero desde el principio. Eh, ningún tema es tabú, ningún tema está fuera de la mesa. Ahora, es cierto, cuando hay un diálogo y un proceso de, de reencuentro nacional y de búsqueda de soluciones comunes, podemos llamarlo reconciliación, porque no ha habido realmente guerra, pero sí hay una ruptura, la gente está muy herida, yo creo. El pueblo necesita ese espacio para reencontrarse. Nosotros tenemos familia divididas por cuestiones políticas, papás que no le hablan a los hijos, esposas que no le hablan a los esposos, aquello es, bueno, nosotros somos latinos también, entonces nos va bien eso de esos niveles de pasiones, pero es cierto que la sociedad requiere ese espacio para volver a hablar y un liderazgo político que llame a un encuentro nacional para, para sanar juntos, para buscar nuestras soluciones y no volver a permitir nunca salir de una buena vez de esta amenaza permanente de Trump encima de nuestras cabezas, que es absolutamente estresante, no solamente para el gobierno, para la gente de la oposición. Las bombas no piden el carnet del partido cuando caen. O sea, en ningún país ha sido así. Nadie van a ver si van a, van a disparar aquí o allá. Los seres humanos se mueren por igual. Y a mí me van a doler tanto todos. Yo los represento a todos. Ese es mi país entero. Yo no quiero esto que esté pasando. ¿Cuál es la expectativa? Esa. Que el pueblo pueda saber que la verdadera política se hace dialogando, que la verdadera política requiere un liderazgo que no tenga miedo, que llame al diálogo y no 
ven Trump, sálvame, cámbiame al presidente y ponme a mí. Eso no puede ser. O sea, ese nivel de inmadurez no puede ser. Yo puedo entender que Guaidó es muy joven y tenga muchas aspiraciones. Es buenísimo que ejerza la política desde la base democrática que nos hemos dado todos los venezolanos, que es esta. Aquí todo. Fuera de aquí nada. Esa es creo la única línea roja. Fuera de aquí nada. Nada. Este es mi país. Esto es lo que nos dimos. La constitución nuestra está tan blindada que tiene incluso mecanismos para salvaguardarse a sí misma, a pesar de que si algún poder trata de cooptarla o de dañarla. El poder que sea. Y para eso está la constituyente, que está establecida en la constitución como garante. Pero esto que ha hecho el señor Guaidó, por ejemplo, de aprobar a la fuerza de paso una ley de transición, ustedes oyeron hablar de aquella ley de transición, de los, de los partidos de la oposición, que son 13, son muchos, Voluntad Popular es el cuarto en número de representantes en la Asamblea Nacional. Una Asamblea Nacional de 167 diputados, de los cuales Voluntad Popular tiene 14 sillas. ¿Puede un partido político con ese peso específico considerar que tiene la legitimidad suficiente para lanzarse por el pecho toda la constitución, la soberanía, todo, yo me lo cuestionaría. Creo que España es uno de los países que tiene, por tener un régimen parlamentario, eso muchísimo más claro. ¿Qué rol y qué peso específico tiene cada quien? Señoras y señores, de las elecciones del 2015, de la Asamblea Nacional que tanto defiende la Unión Europea, el primer partido político sigue siendo el Partido Socialista Unido de Venezuela con 55 sillas de 167, seguido por, seguido por Primero Justicia, que tiene 33, seguido por Un Nuevo Tiempo, que tiene veintitantas, seguido por el quinto partido del país, Partido Político, es Voluntad Popular, tienen 14 escaños, el señor Guaidó ganó uno de esos 14 escaños, con 97 mil y tantos más votos. 97 mil 120 y algo. Maduro tiene 5 millones y medio de votos en una elección presidencial. Hablemos de legitimidad, de origen, de la de origen, la que dan los votantes. La de Guaidó del 2015 contra la de Nicolás Maduro del año de las elecciones de los Términos objetivos. No hay línea roja. La protección de la Constitución está establecida aquí. La ley de transición que estableció Guaidó le permitía hacer una interpretación al Parlamento, a él, él, la redactó y la presentó. Si eso no se llama conflicto de interés, él la redactó para decir que los 30 días que están previstos en el 233 podían ser prorrogables indefinidamente en cuanto y tanto se necesitara. Si eso no es un golpe de Estado, yo no sé qué es. Pero resulta que cuando se votó esa ley de transición, y ustedes pueden buscar la data objetiva en las páginas de la Asamblea Nacional, los dos partidos mayoritarios de la oposición se abstuvieron. Se abstuvieron. Dejaron las manos abajo. No votaron a favor de la ley de transición. Y esos partidos, uno de ellos tiene casi 60 años de existencia en el país, Voluntad Popular tiene apenas 5 años de creado. Este partido político que se llama Acción Democrática y forma parte de la socialdemocracia, uno de los partidos que está en contra del golpe de Estado de Guaidó. La Constitución también establece en el artículo 335 que solamente el Tribunal Supremo de Justicia puede interpretar la Constitución. La Asamblea no tiene esas prerrogativas. Para cualquiera que quiera, la Constitución en inglés la tenemos a disposición en la Embajada. Nuestro equipo está a la disposición también para hacerles llegar este maravilloso material que preparó nuestra misión permanente en las Naciones Unidas, que es el Timeline del de Twitter esquizofrénico de norteamericano contra Venezuela, por horas y minutos. O, información objetiva. Y luego también tenemos una, un análisis 
decorticado de las sanciones por capítulo para aquellos que quieran información más detallada con relación a qué empresas, qué compañías y cómo se bloquea para intereses comerciales eh, una, a un país y la economía de una nación. La estrangulo para después ofrecerle la ayuda. Más o menos el caso, alguien me refería ayer, un caso que hubo famoso, yo no lo conocía, de un enfermero que fue condenado a prisión porque enfermaba a sus pacientes y luego venía a salvarlos. Y parece que mató no sé cuántas personas y lo procesaron y lo... Entonces esto es algo así. Es un enfermero loco que te aprieta la, la, la cánula y después te dice que él te la puede, te puede salvar. Esto es un cambio de régimen. Esto es un golpe tradicional. Claro, es verdad lo que dice Borrell, tiene algunas innovaciones. Están aquí haciendo una mezcla de revolución de colores, con golpes de Estado centroamericano, con bloqueo económico tal como se hizo en Cuba y en Chile, con la receta de Irak, con la proclamación de un gobierno paralelo y por fuera, como hicieron con Libia en un primer, en una, en un primer momento, y además, recientemente, con el secuestro de nuestros activos y nuestros bienes en el extranjero, como hicieron también con Libia, o se olvidaron del rol de Euroclear en ese dossier en particular. ¿No les parece que esta historia ya la han oído antes? Ahora está en Venezuela. Y Venezuela está, vuelvo a repetir, en la frontera de Europa. Yo considero que el titular reciente de un analista francés es cierto. La paz europea empieza en Venezuela. Nosotros continuamos siendo el tercer proveedor de petróleo de esta región, como un todo, como un todo. Y lo otro es que para aquellos que hablan del reconocimiento de Guaidó como un peso de legitimidad, yo creo mucho en la democracia en el voto, como la única forma, creo mucho en eso. Y luego creo que ese eufemismo de hablar de la comunidad internacional para referirse a Europa y a Estados Unidos hay que superar. La comunidad internacional es muchísimo más grande que eso y si bien hay unos 30 países que dicen que reconocen a Guaidó como un presidente, eh, no sé, eh, protocolar, como ha dicho recientemente Borrell, pero que el presidente de verdad es Maduro, pero de la realidad es Maduro, pero el de la, el de la realidad paralela internacional es Guaidó. Bueno, más de 180 y tantos países y Naciones Unidas no lo reconocen como tal. Ya está. Eso es la comunidad internacional. Somos 100, más, casi 200 países. No Europa ni Estados Unidos. There is a question that my, my colleague asked you about the elections. I think it's very important because uh, this is the only thing that, that put together the, the EU in a, in a unitary, unitary position, which was to ask for early, as early as possible uh, new elections. Uh, the question for my colleague was, is it possible to make them together, presidential and uh, political elections together? What is the perspective now? Is it possible to organize for us with a lot of uh, international observers, uh, the EU, etc., uh, elections uh, and when? Is, is this something that uh, the government, Maduro, uh, is uh, discussing? Is, uh, has, is there an intention to do it and when? And uh, if I can ask another thing, uh, uh, you just said, uh, I don't understand this. Spanish, but I, so you just say that uh, the, the Labour Council, the Labour Party, has been approved with the abstention of the two parties of the opposition, the most big ones. Who approved it? Because if the party of Maduro is against it, and the two parties of the opposition are against it. Uh, ask a music 